Welcome to Riverside Church Online. We are so glad that you are joining us here this morning. Here in person, we have some really, really cool things going on that we are going to be able to share with you here in the next couple weeks. We have lots of baptisms actually taking place here this morning in person. And uh, again, we're going to be able to share that with you online here in the next week or two. Um, but we have so many people that are so excited that, that they get to express what's going inward, what's going on inside of them, their passion and their excitement to follow Jesus. They get to share that out outwardly with all of that, with all of us through the act of baptism. So again, if uh, you want to see that, we look forward to sharing it with you here pretty soon. Uh, or if you yourself are interested in being baptized, we look forward to having baptisms all the time here at Riverside. So uh, if you want to be baptized, feel free to contact one of the pastors on staff at Riverside or the front office. We would love to connect you uh, in, in that way. The other things that we have going on, we have small groups and we're so excited to be jumping back in. This is a fantastic time, by the way. If you've never been part of a small group, it's so great to do that. And it, it's an amazing part of our church community. It's such an important um, way to connect in your faith with other followers of Jesus who are going through much of what the same stuff we go through on a daily basis. And we just get to do life with them. Um, it's just an awesome time. If you currently are plugged into a small group, I encourage you to contact your small group leader uh, to find out when it is that you're going to be restarting, hopefully sometime in the next few weeks. Um, um, or if you've never been part of a small group, go ahead and contact the front office. We would love to get you plugged into one if you aren't already. Um, again, along with more community stuff, we have youth group coming back, Wednesday night youth group, where we get to have dinner and, and um, have fun together. We, we do a small group lesson, we play games. It's a great time to, again, have teenagers get together in community much way that the adults do in their small groups. So we look forward to having that. It's Wednesday at 6 30 p.m. Um, just a, a really fun time so we encourage you guys to uh, attend that and if, if you haven't been for a while now's a great time again just to jump back in to all these different awesome things going on around Riverside and one of the ways that we love to worship here obviously here in just a minute we're gonna be um, you know worshiping through the act of, of music and and that's awesome one of the other ways we love to worship around here is through the act of giving and uh, there's several ways in which you can do that. You can do it at riversidechurchofgod.com, however form it is that you love to give off here at the church. Um, or there's a text to give number, which is listed here on the screen. So we just encourage you. Um, we, we love God so much. And again, that is one of our ways of giving back and showing how much we love him is by giving back to the church that he so loves. Guys, we love you guys so much. Let's go ahead and pray before service here. God, we just thank you for what it is that you're gonna do this morning here through Riverside. We thank you for all the people that are getting baptized here today. We look forward to sharing that with the folks online in the future, God. And uh, we just pray that you would speak through the time of worship, that you would move through that time, your Holy Spirit would be active, and that you would also work through Pastor Andrew and his sermon, Lord. We just pray for each person here that this time uh, would be a blessing. Each person that's watching online right now, they would just connect with you in a new way, Lord. We just love you so much, and we just welcome you here. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh 
I want to start our time together today with a story. If you've been around, maybe you've heard this story before, but it's a very impactful one. It involves golf and monkeys. How can a story about golf and monkeys change the way I look at my life? Well, let's just see. I was listening to a podcast uh, not that long ago, and the guy was telling this story uh, about how in the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s, um, Britain occupied the country of India. And uh, one thing that the, the British people realized when they were kind of occupying India was that India didn't have any golf courses. And golf was the game that kind of took up most of your pastime in Britain, Scotland, all those places and everything. So... Uh, the British people who were occupying India decided that they were going to make a golf course so that they could enjoy their pastime, right? So they began building this really beautiful uh, golf course in a city in India. But one thing that the British people didn't account for was the fact that India had monkeys, which Britain did not. So as they began to play their course, they realized that um, monkeys would come out of the jungle, steal their golf balls, and just run off with it. Kind of hard to finish even nine holes when monkeys are stealing your golf balls. So they went on to try all these different ways of solving the monkey problem. Um, since they hadn't really dealt with monkeys before, their first solution was to build a wall. They built a wall to keep the monkeys out. That didn't go very well. The monkeys just climbed over the wall, stole the golf balls, and ran off. Uh, they tried all these different tactics. They tried moving the monkey's food source. There was even this kind of sketchy monkey genocide attempt that kind of happened. A lot of crazy stuff happened, and they could not keep the monkeys from stealing the golf balls. So eventually, their solution was to implement a rule into the course. And that rule was, you play the ball where the monkey drops it. Now, when I was listening to someone tell this story, after that, he said, that's life. That all of us come from different backgrounds. We have different life stories. We have different gift sets. And for some of us, it's harder than others. Some of us, it kind of feels like life is stacked against us. Maybe our family was broken growing up. Maybe we were poor. And maybe there's some of us who kind of had it well off. We had good mom and dad. We had a pretty stable environment. And to live a good life, it isn't so much about complaining and, and being upset about how certain things are stacked against us. It's about realizing that that's where the monkey dropped the ball. And the only thing I have power over is what I do with where the monkey has dropped the golf ball of my life. And, you know, that story was really impactful for me because... Um, uh, you know, it's easy for me to get hung up on stuff I can't change. It's easy for me to get hung up on the things I don't have or I didn't have and think this person has it off better, but I don't really have control over the hand that I was dealt or the hand that they were dealt. And, you know, that story really had me thinking about this section of the Bible we're going to be in today. It's in Matthew chapter 25, and it's this parable of the talents or the parable of the three servants. And it's about three different people who were each dealt a different hand. And what was expected of them was not the hand they were dealt, but what they did with it. And maybe you're feeling some tension right now, thinking about your own life story and thinking about the struggles you've had and the things that were done to you that weren't fair and have negatively impacted you. And you maybe wonder, how in the world can anything good come out of this broken story I've been handed? Well, I invite you to join us today as we continue on in Matthew 25, going through the stories of Jesus, because in this story, it communicates to you and to me what is involved in redeeming story, what is involved in redeeming stories, particularly if we maybe got a hand that was not intended. We look at what Jesus kind of expects out of us. We look at what Jesus has to say about what we're given and what we're supposed to do with it so we can live the best story possible. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 14. And it's helpful to kind of know where we are, because at different times in the Gospels, in Jesus' ministry, he kind of has to use a different tone at different times, depending on who he's talking to. And as we get into Matthew 25, Jesus is really close to the cross. He doesn't have time to horse around. He wants people to be crystal clear about some of the things that he's saying. He wants these people, his followers, the people who even are going to kill him, he wants them to have the info they need to be able to carry on without him after he dies and rises again. 
And just before this story, Jesus has kind of been calling the religious people out on their stuff. He's kind of been saying, you know what? This is not good. What you're doing is not good. Earning your way to God and oppressing people is not good. You need to do things my way. So occasionally we'll hear some sharp words of Jesus stick through because the context is him trying to communicate an important message to some of us who are a little thick headed. So we begin today in Matthew 25, starting in chapter uh, verse 14. And he says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. And this sets the framework for this whole story and really our entire series. We've been following the stories of Jesus and so many of Jesus' stories have started this way. They talk about the kingdom of heaven and they talk about a story. And this is an important thing for you and for me because Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven more than anything else when he talks in the gospels. And Jesus tells stories a third of the time that he speaks in the gospels. We need to listen with open ears when Jesus talks about the kingdom. And we need to listen with open hearts when he talks in story. And the kingdom of heaven is important because the kingdom of heaven means that we're not just suffering through life for nothing. The kingdom of heaven means that there won't always be struggle. There won't always be strife. There won't always be destruction in the world, but we are moving towards a kingdom that will come to full fruition when Jesus comes back. He's not just instituting a, a, a cute set of rules to adhere to. He's not just uh, coming to give you some kind of a social ethic. He is building a kingdom. And he invites you and me to be participants in this kingdom, to be royalty in this kingdom on behalf of what he's done. And that's so important because it's so easy for you and me to try to build our own kingdoms. And if we don't understand that Jesus is building a kingdom and we're to reorient our lives around the king and the kingdom he's making on his terms, then we're going to grossly misunderstand Jesus. He's building a kingdom. And in his stories, he communicates what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he often does it through his stories. And I love that he communicates through stories because stories are the way that we make sense of the world. And the reality is, is every decision we make, you and I are writing a story. Every decision in our life has built the story that we're currently living for good or for bad. And while we're writing a story, God is writing this giant kingdom story throughout history. And the loving, good Savior, Jesus Christ, is inviting your story to drastically change for the better as you let it be affected, impacted, and reoriented around God's story, which he's written through Jesus Christ. So today, as we even enter this, maybe you've been building your own kingdom. Maybe you're kind of at rock bottom right now. Maybe you feel like there's no hope for your story. But this very story we're looking at today is one that says, no, 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 there is hope. No matter what hand you've been dealt, there is hope for your story to be redeemed and to multiply. And it's important that we know that as the framework as we get started. He goes on in the second half of the verse to say, he, this, um, this man going on a long trip, he called together his servants and he entrusted them with money while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. And then he left for his trip. So we set the stage, the story, a guy, probably a wealthy guy, a guy with a lot of land, a guy with a lot of money. He's going on a trip and he gives his money to these people for them to take care of. He entrusts them with his money. Now, this is really important because this gets at something that is at the heart of being a Christian. And it's this understanding that Jesus gives us things and that we are not owners, we are stewards. Stewards. This word steward is a word that means that I'm not the one who owns it. I'm the one who's taking care of it. It's a lot like uh, if someone buys seeds for the garden, buys the plot of land, buys all the water for you to use, buys all the fertilizer for you to use, plants the seeds and asks you to watch and water them. They're not your seeds. It's not your land. You're not using your fertilizer. You're a caretaker, a caretaker for what you have been given. 
That is the approach that we as Christ followers take to everything. The breath in our lungs is a gift that God has given us. The very life we have in Christ is a gift that he has given us. The the money that we make from our jobs is something that he has provided for us. Us. There's this tension to being a Christ follower of trusting in what Jesus has given us and also working with our abilities. And part of being a Christ follower and operating in the story of God, the way he wants us to, the way where it's going to lead to our flourishing is understanding that we have been entrusted with things. We've been entrusted with gifts that he's given us. We've been entrusted with our family members. We've been entrusted with our friends, with our jobs. These are things Christ has entrusted us with so that we can expand his kingdom in these areas. And if we live our life as owners rather than stewards, we're not going to be operating in the kingdom the way Jesus wants us to. If I'm an owner rather than a steward, I don't care if I blow my money on whatever I want to blow my money on. But if I am a steward, I think carefully about how I will use the money that Christ has given me. If I am an owner of my time, then I'll waste it however I want. Netflix galore, you know, I'll just kind of be on my couch eating bonbons all the time. But if I realize that time is actually a gift that Jesus has given me to use to expand his kingdom, I'm going to be a lot more thoughtful about how I use that time. This idea of Jesus entrusting us with things the way this owner entrusts these people with silver is something that we need to know as an important principle of following Jesus. So he gives one five bags of silver, one two bags, and another one bag. And uh, your version might say bags of silver, bags of gold, bags of, uh, might say a, a talent. Um, all those are different ways of communicating the amount that it would have been in this day and age. And in this day and age, uh, the amount is really going to end up uh, getting down to this idea of about 75 pounds worth of money. That's a lot of money. It's about 15 years wage is what some commentators have kind of come to the conclusion to. That um, a, one of the bags is about 15 years wage. That's a lot of money. And he gives each of them in proportion to their abilities. Here's the deal. This um, word abilities is this Greek word, which means potential for functioning in some way, power, might, strength, force, capability. This word for ability in the Bible, as it's using it right here, is a word that means potential. So he gives each of these people different amounts based on their potential. Now, what makes up potential? Is it What you're born with? Yeah, kind of. Is it your willingness and ability to use it well? Yeah, kind of. Is it your willingness to learn and do better every day? All of those kind of make up this idea of potential. And Jesus bestows uh, the money in this case, or maybe gifts or the time you've been given. He bestows it in such a way that it is based on the potential of the people. And as we're going to see later on, the faithfulness we have in what we've been given determines what Jesus entrusts us with even more. So before we even get into it too much, here's kind of what we're talking about here. We've all been given different things. We all have different life stories. We've all been dealt a different hand. But what matters is not so much the hand we've been dealt as it is the potential we have to let Jesus use that for the expansion of his kingdom. I'm going to say that again. What matters is not so much the hand we've been dealt or the amount of gifts that we've been given, but the amount of potential we have for allowing Jesus to use what he has given us to expand his kingdom. And after he gives them in the proportion of their abilities, he leaves for a trip. He entrusts them with him. He wants them to use these well, and he goes on his trip. And what do they do with it? What do they do with it after he leaves on his trip? That's the question for you and for me. We all have different gifts that we've been given by Jesus. Maybe you have the gift of friendship. Maybe you have the gift of encouragement. Uh, Maybe you've been financially blessed. Maybe you have more free time in your life right now to share God's goodness with others. The question then is, I have these things that Jesus has given me. What do I do with it now? And that's what we're going to get into as we continue the story. So Jesus goes on in this story to tell us 
what it looks like to use the gifts and the situations and the stories we've been handed. He says in verses 16 through 18, the servant who received five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant who had two bags of silver, he also went and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and he hid the master's money. So we got three servants and a few approaches here to how they use what God has given them. The first one invests. And you know, the thing about investment is that there's risk associated with it. You know, many of us are scared to use the gifts God's given us. We're scared to share the stories of what God has done in our life because we're afraid of the risk. What if I fail? What if I reveal the broken parts of my story that Jesus has healed and people think of me differently? Sometimes we have some fear associated with taking that next step and letting Jesus use our story and our gifts the way that he wants to. But you know, Sometimes with great risk, there's great reward. And if we know that Jesus is at the center and that we're honestly um, giving of our time, our talent, our abilities, even if we're scared of failure, even if we're scared of revealing the broken parts of our stories for God's glory, the risk will be worth it if Jesus is leading us to it. This first man invests. He's willing to risk. He's willing to kind of step into the scary work of potentially failing so that he can do well with the master's money. And then the second guy, he, it says he kind of puts his money to work. A reminder that for you and I, that putting our gifts and our story to work is part of the equation. That we do have to do the hard work of saying, Jesus, is it going to hurt a little bit for me to use this money that I've been using for my fun stuff to do what you want me to with it, to, to bless the hurting, to bless the poor, to bless the church you've placed me at? Is that going to maybe hurt a little bit? Is it going to maybe take some hard work to trust and believe in what Jesus is calling us to do with our money and our gifts and our story? Yeah, it's not always easy work, but Jesus through the giving of the Holy Spirit who empowers us, who guides us, and who leads us, wants us to be able to put in that work to expand his kingdom. And then there's the third approach here where the guy hides it, where the guy decides to hide the master's money. You know, from the very beginning of scripture, hiding has always been associated with fear. When Adam and Eve sin in the first chap- few chapters of the Bible, they sin they're afraid and they hide. The posture of these three people is all quite different. The first two seem like they have an understanding of who their master is. And because of that, they're willing to risk a little bit. They're willing to put in the hard work because they know their good master wants to expand his wonderful kingdom. And they feel blessed that they're able to take part in it. And this third man digs a hole in the ground and he hides the money. Is it because he's scared of the master? Is it because he's scared of failure? Is it because he doesn't see himself clearly through the master's eyes? We begin to see a little bit of that as we continue on in the story. In verse 19, the master returns. It says, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and and called them to give an account of how they had used the money. Now, I don't know about you, but um, some of the words in there make me uncomfortable. Maybe you feel that too. The master comes home from his trip and he wants them to give an account for how they used his money. How many of you hate the feeling when your manager comes in to check the back room after you were supposed to tidy it up? How many of us hate it when our boss comes in to see if we really cleaned the way we were supposed to clean? How many of us hate going through our progress reports or our employee evaluations with our bosses? There's a lot of fear associated with that. What if I did something wrong? What if I didn't do good enough? What if he's just going to just going to just going to totally flip out on me? This idea of being taken into account of accountability is a very freaky thing, right? We don't really like to be accountable. I want to do my own thing. I don't really want you to watch me. I want everything to be good, right? And especially as we talk about Jesus in the kingdom of heaven, what's this deal with accountability? What is this deal with Jesus kind of sizing things up? Jesus kind of repaying good and evil. How does that work? How does an all loving God who saves us on behalf of himself still be a God of judgment, a God who sets things right, and a God who will ultimately 
ultimately hold everyone accountable. How do we make sense of that? And particularly in the West, we have a lot of trouble making sense of those two things because we either want lightning bolt God or teddy bear God. We don't want a God who is loving and merciful and just. We either want a loving God or a just God. But to truly understand God and all of his goodness and all of his holiness, we need to know him as love and justice. And all of this kind of comes to this point being made in verse 19 here, that at some point, Jesus is going to show up and make all things right. And that should be of great comfort to us, that the brokenness we see in the world, that the hurt we see in our world, that the hurt we've maybe even seen in our own families and in our own stories does not get the final say because Jesus is going to make all things right. And what we need to understand about Jesus is that there's this interesting component that the Bible talks about about how if we're found in Jesus, we confess him as Savior and Lord, we're saved. We're saved on the behalf of who Jesus is. We're made right with him. We have an eternal destiny with him. But there is still this understanding that people are rewarded based on what they've done. We are saved based on Christ, but since he's not only a loving God, but a just God, there will be accountability and rewards based on what we have and haven't done. Here's a few verses of what the Bible says about the fact that we can be saved on behalf of Jesus and that we still reap the rewards of our actions in the next life. In Romans 2, 6, it says, um, Jesus will render to each person according to their deeds. In 1 Corinthians 3, 8, it says that each will receive their own reward according to their own labor. In Revelation twenty two twelve, 12, at the very end of scripture, Jesus says, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man and woman according to what they have done. There's this tension in scripture where we don't, if we've given our lives to Jesus, we don't need to just be stressed out all the time. Like, did it really work? But we do need to understand that part of Jesus being a just God means that we're rewarded based on how obedient and how willing we were to listen to what Jesus wanted us to do and to respond accordingly with our gifts and our time and our talents. That Jesus will hold us all accountable doesn't mean that it's like, you know, he's doing this little tally sheet of whether we'll get into heaven. Um, I was a kid of the 90s, and I don't know what it was about cartoons in the 90s, but all of them had a go to hell episode. Like Tom and Jerry, Tom and Jerry terrified me for a long time because there's this episode where like Tom tries to kill Jerry the mouse and he dies in the process of doing it. And he goes up to the pearly gates and the cats at the pearly gates, which I don't know if that's a thing. The cats at the pearly gates are like, uh, you didn't do so good. You have 24 hours to make things right or else you're toast. I think there's a lot of us who think that that's the way that Jesus does things, even though that's just kind of the way that the nineties cartoons did things. And we can't live our life in fear like servant with the one bag, thinking that anything that we're going to do at any given moment is going to cancel, that Jesus is just going to cancel us, right? Jesus says, all who call on me as Savior and Lord will be saved. But we have to hold that intention with this idea that Jesus rewards accordingly as the perfect, just judge. It doesn't make sense that the person who gave his life to Jesus, but just sits on his couch the whole life, gets the exact same rewards in kingdom come as the missionary who gave his life as a martyr. There are rewards in heaven and that Jesus will kind of dull these things based out as the perfect judge that will all be saved. But we do need to understand that there is accountability and that there is an ultimate um, judging that happens with our great judge as to, as to what we do based on our deeds. Doesn't mean we need to be worried about hell all the time if we've confessed Jesus as our savior and Lord, but it does need to have us keep intention that our actions and what we do with our story, with the things Jesus has given us matters. And that's what it's going to talk about a little bit as we continue on in the next few verses. He continues on in verse 20. And he says, the servant to whom he had entrusted with five bags of silver came forward with five more. He doubled it. And he said, master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest. And look, I have earned five more. 
And at this, the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you even many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Another version says, come and enter into the joy of your master. How beautiful is that? Some of us are scared of being used by Jesus because we're scared that we'll open ourselves up to it. And this is not the response we're going to get. But this guy, he put in the risk. He was willing to say, here I am, use me. And as a result, he doubled the amount that he was given. How crazy is that? He put in the work to use his story well, to use his time well, to use his money and his talents that he had been given well. And he doubled it. He doubled it. And the master is so excited. The master shows up and he says, let's party I will give you more. That is something that is so important that we see with all these people here is that he, the master says to him, well done. You have been faithful in handling a small amount and I will give you more responsibilities. That Jesus is looking for faithfulness in what he has given us. He's not looking us for, um, uh, to make, to, to do with what we don't have. He is looking for us to be faithful with what he has given us. So what does it mean to be a five silver bag kind of person? Because here's the reality. Like I said, the monkey drops the ball wherever the monkey drops the ball, right? Um, Some of us have more capacity than others. Some of us are wired differently. Some of us are driven in different ways. Some people, they got all of the, they got it all. You know, you know those people. You uh, unfollow them on Instagram all the time because they're the good looking people. They're the people with the perfect family. They're the perfect people who have the great job. They're the people who can sing well. They're the people who can play any instrument. They're the people who are good at power tools. They're the people who can fix their cars. And they're all kind of wrapped up in this five silver bag package, right? Maybe you've been given a lot. Maybe that's just kind of the hand you've been dealt, what you've worked for. Maybe you've been given a lot. Maybe you have an abundance of money. Maybe you have a lot of time. Maybe you have a great family. Maybe you have a lot of skills. Maybe that's the hand you were dealt. Maybe that's where the monkey dropped the golf ball, so to speak. If that is the case, Jesus wants you to be faithful with that. If you have a lot of money, Jesus wants you to use that for the kingdom. Maybe that's investing in people. Maybe that's discipling people. Maybe that's giving to the hurting, to the oppressed, giving to your church. If you're a five silver bag person and you ain't giving to the church, you're missing out on something, man. Because Jesus calls us to be faithful with what he's given us. And if you're a five silver bag kind of person, you got a lot of money to use. You got a lot of time to give. You got a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of capacity to give. Jesus wants you to give it. He doesn't want you to just sit there stagnant, stalling, not sure what to do. He wants you to use it for the glorifying of his kingdom so that you can help the kingdom of Jesus reach all kinds of people to have their stories impacted, just like Jesus has impacted yours. Then he goes on in the next couple verses to say, the servant who had received two bags of silver, he came forward and said, master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I've doubled it. I've earned two more. To which the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount. Now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Same program, different amount. And it's important that we see that. That Jesus isn't asking you to be something that you're not. If you're kind of a two silver bag person rather than like a five silver bag person, I mean, you're doing okay but like you don't have a mansion. Uh, You got a couple of good rickety cars. There ain't nothing to write home about, but they work. I got a little bit of time to give. I have some spheres of influence to invest in, not quite as much as uh, the Instagram model, but I do. Jesus still wants you to use everything that you have. He's not upset with the two bag servant for not having as much as the five bag servant. He just wants that person to use what they've been given. He wants them to be faithful with what they have. And you know, maybe you're a two bag person today and you've always kind of been a little weary because you're not a five bag person. I don't have a great gift of teaching, so I don't really want to participate in church. 
I don't really think that I have very many skills. I don't think many people are interested in my skills. I don't necessarily make a lot of money. I'm not exactly um, having the opportunities to go on these grand vacations. I'm so-so. Maybe that's the thing that has kept you from really investing in the kingdom of God. But what this story, what Jesus wants to communicate is it's not about how much you've been given. It's about how much you're giving of what you've been given. It's not about um, the, the lack or the abundance of what you've been given. It's that what you've been given is a gift from God and he wants you to give all of it back to him for the expansion of his kingdom. That's how it is if you're the hundred dollar guy or if you're the penny guy or if you're somewhere in the middle. Jesus wants you to use what he's given you, whether that's a lot or whether that's a little. And you know what one of the really comforting things is? Sometimes we look at the people who are like the five bag people and we get overwhelmed. But did you know that the most successful people in the world have the exact same amount of hours in a day as you do? Did you know that regardless of how successful you are, you only get 24 hours in a day? That is one of the only things in this life where we all get an equal amount. So even if you're like, I'm not the five bag person, I don't sing well, I don't play an instrument well, I'm not very good at this, I don't have very many skills at this. You know what you have as much of as people like Steve Jobs or something like that? Is the fact that we all have 24 hours in a day. And part of stewarding that time well means that we realize and understand that all of that time is a gift for God. And we need to reorient our life and our time and our priorities around how God wants us to use that stuff to build his kingdom and glorify him. So maybe you're a little overwhelmed when you see how successful other people are and you're not sure what you can give. God is just asking you to give what you got not what you don't have. So I invite you, if you're one of those two bag people, how might he want you to use your time? How might he want you to use your money? How might he want you to use your influence to glorify him? And then finally, we get to the third servant in verses 25, 24 through 25. It says, then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, master, I knew you were a harsh man harvesting crops that you didn't plant and gathering crops that you didn't cultivate. I was afraid that I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth and look, here's your money back. Very different approach than the first two. And one thing that really stands out to me here is his posture towards the master is totally different. And it seems like it stems from a place of him not really understanding who the master is. Look at what he says. Master, I knew you were harsh, that all the things you have, you didn't do. You didn't do to get. And I was afraid of you. So I hid those echoes of Genesis 3. I don't understand God. So when I mess up, I'm going to hide from God. But in Genesis 3, God shows up and he says, you know, Adam, Eve, where are you? He doesn't just come down storming, lightning bolting. He asks for presence. And This servant here seems to have a picture of the master that's very different than the first two because the first two come up celebrating to the master and this one comes up hiding. Not understanding the heart of God is something that we really need to address in our lives because if we don't see God for who he really is, full of love, full of goodness, wanting to use us, wanting to redeem, if we don't see him for who he truly is, we're going to be hesitant to do things from him. Because if we think that he's just an angry dad up in the sky, getting ready to lightning bolt us at any moment, why would we want to give our lives for that? Why would we want to give our time, our talent, our treasures for that? That's the struggle here with the last servant. But the reality is, is that if God wasn't a good God, why did he die for you? Why would he possibly die for me? Knowing every brokenness I've ever had, every hurt I've ever given someone else, every wrong thing I've ever done. If he wasn't a good God, why would he die for me? Why would he give me what I don't deserve and take on what I do deserve? The character of Jesus represented in his life, his death and his resurrection, his love, grace, compassion, redemption. And it is important that we flood our hearts and our souls with the reality of that so that we see 
that he is not a harsh master, but a loving master, one who gives us what we don't deserve and takes what we do deserve. And you know, as people were hearing this story, one of the things that they would have been very aware of is the reality that there's some of them that were servant number one. They dropped the ball. They they, they, they hadn't used what God wanted them to. They hadn't shown love the way that God wanted them to. They hadn't used their finances to expand God's kingdom. They hadn't used their skills to help bless other people. And rather than stepping in and saying, Master, I'm struggling. Master, help me. Master, lead me towards this. Master, help me see who you really are. They hid. And as a result, this is what happens in the next couple verses. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew that I harvested crops that I didn't plant and gathered crops that I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least then I could have gotten some interest on it. And you know, we see that and we kind of might be like, dang, that's a little harsh, right? Master here saying wicked, lazy, all these different things. And here's what's interesting is that the master here sees the heart of his servant, that his servant didn't try and fail. His servant did nothing. Now here's the thing. Some of us don't want to try because we don't want to fail. But the problem here is not that the guy tried and failed, it's that he did nothing. It's that his life wasn't really reoriented around the master and his work. It's that his priorities were not really changed by the master. This person uh, liked the idea of the master, but he didn't actually let the master impact his life to such a degree that it's transforming it. And even if he would have just tried The master had already shown that he was so proud of these servants for trying. If he had just tried, how different would the situation have looked? And then in the next couple verses, it says, Then the master ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and then they will have an abundance. But to those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Jesus is getting at this idea here, this idea of how the world works, the idea of how things work in his kingdom, this principle that he doesn't want you to do nothing. He wants you to do something. It's not about having more than you have. It's about doing with what he has given you. And those who are faithful with what Jesus gives, he will give more things to use. He will allow them to expand the kingdom even even more. But to those who do nothing, They're going to get even less. And you know, this is just kind of a basic work principle. Any kind of job that you have, if you have people who are crushing it, you're going to give them more to do. If you have people who don't do anything, eventually they get fired, right? Jesus here is wanting to communicate to you and to me that there's no in-between when it comes to Jesus. That you're either doing it or you're not. You're either following him or you're not. There's no kind of when it comes to following Christ. It's very much like the Yoda principle. Do or do not, there is no try, right? That's what Yoda says on the back of Luke's back while he's training him. When it comes to Jesus, he either has your everything or he doesn't. You've either given your life to Jesus or you're kind of still doing your own thing. Now, there's a tension to that, right? Because part of our life is growing in this thing that Jesus calls sanctification. This process of becoming more like him, of giving more of our life to him. The question is, are we going to let our lives be reoriented around Jesus or are we going to be in the driver's seat? Because Jesus isn't just savior, he's Lord. That means Jesus, you're in the driver's seat. That means even if I veer off the road a little bit, I'm going to let Jesus, my ultimate driver, get me back on course. Jesus wants you to do something with what you've been given because he's given it all for you. He wants you to use what he has given you. He wants you to be all in. He wants you to let him have the driver's seat. He doesn't want you to say, I like the church thing, but I'm not actually going to give my life over to Jesus. He wants you to say, I want to be invested in the kingdom. I want to be used in the kingdom. I want you to use me in the way that you want me to be used. And the story ends with this last verse, which is going to kind of sound scary, but it's actually going to end up being very, very hopeful. 
The master finishes by saying, now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The end. Isn't that great? No, uh, it's kind of scary, right? You read that and you're like thinking, do you know how many times I've messed up? Do you know how many times I haven't done what God wanted me to do? Do you know how many times I've tried to take the driver's seat? Now you're just telling me I'm going to live out in the darkness with the wild dogs? That's freaky, man. It is. But here's what the author here is getting at. Here's what Jesus is getting at. When we decide not to let Jesus take the driver's seat in our lives, when we decide not to invest in the kingdom, when we decide to not use the gifts that Jesus has given us, we end up fearing God. We end up having a different perspective of God. We aren't allowing our hearts and our minds to be shaped and transformed by Jesus. And when we experience shame, when we know we're not living the way that we're supposed to, as humans, we naturally recoil. Rather than leaning in and saying, Jesus, help me, we recoil and we end up outside on our own. How often does that happen? That we're making mistakes, we're not doing with our life what we ought to, and we separate ourselves from family, we separate ourselves from friends, we build this own cage of darkness for us to leave in because live in because of the shame and knowing that we've messed up and knowing that we've failed. The difference between living a life of shame and living a life for Christ is that when we mess up, we can lean into Jesus. He already took care of our sin on the cross. He knows we're going to mess up. If we mess up, if we haven't used our gifts the way we wanted to, if we haven't reoriented our lives around him the way we need to, we can lean in and say, Jesus, I've messed up. Help me. And he who is faithful will forgive us and help us. It says that in the book of 1 John. The question is, are we going to separate ourselves from him? Are we going to hide our face like Adam and Eve did? Are we going to hide like the one bag servant did and, and separate ourselves into a dark corner with nasty dogs where we're beating ourselves up? Or are we going to lean in to the savior who wants to use you and redeem your story? Even if up to this point, you have just been making a mess of your life story and you don't know if there's any of it that Jesus can use, he is inviting you to lean in. This is a note that theologian N.T. Wright makes about this last verse. He says, when Jesus speaks of someone being thrown into the darkness outside where people weep, and grind their teeth. We must never forget that Jesus himself, as he tells this story, was on his way into a darkness where even he would sense himself, the abandonment of God. That Jesus says this at the end of this story. And part of what we need to understand is that just not that much longer and Jesus Christ himself would be abandoned by God so that you and I would never have to be abandoned by God. That he would die on a cross so that every sin I've committed, every brokenness you've committed could be taken care of on that cross. And shortly later, he would rise again from his tomb in a resurrection that gives you and I life that we don't deserve. When we look at this story we need to realize and understand and come to grips with the reality that the, one of the ultimate things that Jesus gives us is life in his death and in his resurrection. And he wants us to use that life he's given us to share his goodness with others. You know, I don't know what your skill set might be. I don't know what your finances look like. I don't know what your story might necessarily look like. But I do know that regardless of what it is, from the top tier to what you might consider the bottom tier, Jesus wants to use all of it. Because to Jesus, it's not a matter of how much or how little you have. It's a matter of how you use it for the kingdom. And we can use it to our fullness because we aren't graded ultimately based on what we've done, but what Jesus has done. And in this crazy flip-flop thing, Jesus wants us to use all we are for his kingdom and part of the way we live that in its fullness is by realizing that we're not doing it to earn our place in heaven. We're doing it out of the place that Jesus has earned for us. That's what fuels us to work for the kingdom. That's what fuels us to use our talents, our gifts, our finances to glorify Jesus.
We look at this story, and one of the things that Jesus is trying to communicate to us is that you have been given gifts and a story that God wants to redeem and use. The question is, will you let him? Will you open yourself up to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and let him use every part of your life to expand his kingdom and show others his love and his goodness? In light of this, here's what I would invite us to do. Honestly, right now, just just take a minute and think, what part of my life still needs to be used by God? So much of our life story is finding those areas of our heart that we need to continually surrender to Jesus so that he can use it for the expansion of his kingdom. Maybe you do a really good job of serving in church, but Jesus hasn't touched your finances. You're not using them to bless other people. You're not using them to give to your local church. You're not using them in a way that God wants to glorify. Or, you know, consequently, maybe you're really generous with your finances, but you won't give anybody the time of day. And Jesus is asking you to give someone more time. Maybe God is inviting you to share parts of your story that he wants to use to heal others. You've been like, I don't want to share that with people. I'm scared to share that with people. But Jesus is saying, you know what? Step into honesty and share that part of your story that other people might be healed. What part of your story does Jesus still need to use? Maybe it's your finances, maybe it's your skill set, maybe it's your time. What area is it that needs to be used? As Jesus starts revealing that in your heart and your head, I invite you to take that next step in the area, a small step. Like I said, uh, Jesus is not concerned about whether you try and fail. He's concerned about you doing nothing. So if Jesus is asking you to maybe share an area of your story to bring healing to someone, ask him, Jesus, do you want me to share about that time that I lost it all? That time that I made some bad financial decisions, that time my marriage was struggling, but you healed me? Who do you want me to tell that to? Maybe if it's of giving your time, say, you know what, Jesus? Stand in front of your calendar and say, "Uh, Jesus, what things can I give up so that I can use this time to glorify you? Maybe spending time getting coffee with people or volunteering or helping people in need. Or maybe you look at your bank account and your budget this month and you say, you know what, Jesus, what parts of this are maybe unnecessary? What part of this maybe should I move some stuff from over here to over here to glorify you? I invite you to take that first step and it starts with just honestly evaluating. If Jesus is talking to you about maybe using your skills, your time, whatever it may be, as Jesus is putting that on your heart and on your mind, maybe the next step is standing in front of your calendar, standing in front of your budget, um, taking that step to say, you know what, Jesus, I want to use this to glorify you and share your goodness with others. Whether that's your skills, your time, your, your, your treasure, whatever it is. I invite you to ask Jesus today, what part of my story, what part of my life do you want me to use in this season? I'm maybe not using it. What do you want me to use, Jesus? And then take that next step to walk in to the expansion of the kingdom that Jesus wants you to so that ultimately we can hear those words that that servant heard come into the joy of the master. Jesus loves you. And Jesus wants you to live your story as full as it can possibly be. And part of that means using what he has given you to glorify him, expand his kingdom, and spread his goodness to others. And we can do it, not on behalf of what I've done, not on behalf of what you've done, but on the fact that this master is not an evil, harsh master, but he is a loving master who died for you and for me. And he doesn't want us to shrink away into the darkness. He wants to lean in and us to lean in and say, here I am, Lord, use me. I'm operating out of what you've given me. I'm leaning into you when I struggle and fail. And I am following you so that I can experience the joy of the master as I expand his kingdom. Would you pray with me today? Dear Jesus, we come to you today and Father, we pray that you and your goodness and your love would reveal the things in our life that you want us to use, to take that next step in wholehearted devotion to you, to use our time, our talents, and our treasures to expand your kingdom and share your goodness with others. God, may we see that you are not a harsh master, but a loving master who died for us. 
And out of that love and goodness, we would move out and share your goodness with others. God, may we see that it's not about us being the the best looking or the most talented or the fanciest God, but instead it's just simply using what you've given. Reveal to us what you've given us and how you want us to use that to share your love with others, God. We love you and we give you everything today and we pray that we would not shrink away from you and hide from you when we fail, but instead we would lean in because you are faithful and good to forgive us and to walk alongside us and walk with us in our brokenness, God. Thank you for being good. Thank you for being loving and help us to give you everything because you gave us everything. We love you and we thank you and it's in your holy and precious name that we pray today. Amen. I'm so glad you decided to join us today as we finish up our Storyteller series with this story. It's kind of a wild one, right? But I'm so thankful that Jesus in his goodness and in his love on his way to the cross shares this story with you and me to say that our stories are not worthless, that the things that we've been given are not worthless, but they are meant to be used to share God and his goodness. I pray that you are well as you go through the rest of your week, that God would reveal to you the areas of his life, of your life that he continues to want to operate in, to work in, and to use. I pray that in all things you would be supremely blessed and continue to grow as followers of Jesus in all that you do. We invite you to join us uh, uh, next week as we're going to kick off small groups coming up very, very soon. If you're still interested in getting connected up with one, we invite you to uh, make a phone call or send us an email and we'll get you hooked up with the right one for you. Invite you to join us next week and above all else, reorient your life around Christ this week and experience his goodness and love as you allow him to impact and change your heart. Pray that you are blessed today, church. We'll see you soon.